All right, everyone. Let's talk about episode 10. I have my guest here. Let's start from here. And let's do this. Pencil. Uh, new. Okay. All right, episode 10. I'm excited to have my guest, Jed Gilchrist. Yes. And Jed, um, your misheard song lyric is from Spandau Ballet, mm -hmm. right? From the 80s. Um, and the correct lyric is, I know this much is true. It's in the chorus. What did you think <laughs> and it, it makes was? perfect sense now. <laughs> but at the time, I definitely didn't quite understand it. For some reason, I thought it said, the sergeant's chihu. The sergeant's chihu. I don't know why. <laughs> and sergeant's chew for some... Is it still a rat? It's a, it's a bubble gum, right? Well, that's big league chew. Oh, I'm getting it confused. <laughs> I think you're giving me way too much credit. I really wish that I had some sort of excuse. But I was just a child fumbling my way through language. And I did not even think that... Why would the song title be in... In this portion of the song, I don't know. I have no excuse for it at all, but it still is rings in my head you. to this day. And it makes sense to me. So um, let's step back, everyone. Jed Gilchrist, how do you and I know each other? <laughs> let's talk about that first. Well, we, we went to high school together. Yes. But we didn't know it at the time because I don't think I remember No, because I, you, I you was were, older. So you I just think graduated. I just graduated and you, can't, you were in that. Because we were in that weird three year high yeah. school that not a lot of people have, right? Yes. So, um, but I, uh, you were a contemporary of uh, one of my friend's older brothers, Ted, and yes. uh, and we, our paths crossed again, I guess you were just saying, about 10 years ago, yeah, um, oh we found our way into a band, and I don't even remember how that came to be. I can tell you, because okay. I, I have a mind of a steel trap, a steel trap <laughs> from mine. So that's someone does. So, um, band, a mutual person, Steve, mm -hmm. um, who I used to work with in my industry, Wanted to start a band. He'd see me do karaoke and said, let's do something. Oh, okay. And then had a jam session at Steve's house, and you were there. Okay. Yep. And he's like, I got this great friend that is a great drummer. I mean, everything. Now, everyone, Jed can do drums. <laughs> he can do guitar. I don't know if you do keyboards, too. I do. I attempt. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And any percussion and sings very well. And so... And then we found out from starting this band called Detention Room. Yeah. <laughs> Still getting hits on Facebook. Okay. All right. Um, we had the mutual friends. Ted is, of course, um, our mutual. And then you went to school with his brother, Joe. Yep. Who is yep. a famous news guy locally in Indeed. our town. So we got some big, big people we know. That's true. Um, but the cool thing is we haven't seen each other from today. So this is a reunion of sorts for almost 10 years. Yeah. I think 09 was the last time we saw each other. So it is 10 years. And he has a beautiful wife and twin boys that are just awesome, seven. But I want you also to share with the um, listeners before we go into... The sergeant's chew. <laughs> um, what you're kind of doing now for your... I know you have a regular job that pays bills, like all mm -hmm. of us. But what, what what is your other job that just helps your passion? So I'm trying to get it off the ground. Okay. Uh, but we... Uh, right now, it's just an avocation. So I... Um, music has been around my family and myself mm -hmm. for years and years. Obviously, played a bunch of instruments and listened to it in all kinds and flavors. And so um, a friend of a friend caught wind that um, I had a house that I was interested in coming up with a new uh, purpose for that was more creative. Mm -hmm. my, my folks unfortunately passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, being an only child, um, I was the executor of the estate. Oh. And there was this house that they had spent their lives building. Um, it was their dream house, an A-frame, in the woods on seven acres. Oh my um, God, seven acres. Yeah, tucked away. Uh, in the you know rural areas of Beaverton that mm -hmm. still exist. And Beaverton, by the way, for those that are um, listening to us internationally and globally, is a, a beautiful suburb out of Oregon in the United States. Yes, indeed. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so they they carved out their little dream home Aww. and built it with their bare hands. And so you know letting that go no, um, seemed I wouldn't. just a difficult thing oh, to gosh, do no. um and so i was trying to come up with like what am i going to do with the space it doesn't seem right to just let it rot it doesn't right. seem right to just treat it as a uh, storage facility yeah. and then i had this flash of inspiration and i was having simultaneously having uh lunch with my boss who okay. gave me a similar sentiment and at that moment my wife texted me that she and her mom were talking about it and had the same sentiment and all all of us kind of came to this 
universal conclusion that I should turn it into a music studio. And that was the universe talking. So I've talked to some of our listeners and friends of mine that I am, the older I get, I'm learning, the universe is always telling us things throughout our lives, but we don't listen. Mm -hmm. And at Mm -hmm. that moment, the universe loudly sang to all of you and said, do this. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think I'm like you, like I tend to dismiss that. Yeah. But uh, this was a moment when I seized the opportunity and, uh, and took it and ran. So, I mean, obviously I don't know anything about doing such a thing. I had the space, but what do I do from here? I, I like music and all that. It's not quite what you need. So a similar serendipity struck once again, shortly thereafter, I had mentioned this casually to a friend of mine who had another friend whose band was looking for a space to record their next album. Oh my gosh. And, uh, we met and, uh, hit it off and he checked out the space and fell in love and, uh, long story short, mm-hmm. years later, uh, they've just wrapped recording of their fourth album oh my there God. at the house. Oh my God! Damn. Written and recorded there, and uh, it comes out in April. The band's <sighs> called Other Lives. Other Lives. Okay, uh, we'll we'll do a, a link to Good. their yeah. website as Excellent. well as a link. Can you share with us the name of your studio? Or uh, you... Cooper Mountain Sound, in honor of the uh, the, the modest mountain on which it's built. <laughs> uh, it's like a, it's like I think it's considered uh, a conical projection at best, like okay. 700 feet. Hey, it's, but they it's call it Cooper Mountain. Mountain. I'm yeah, yeah, Cooper. So Cooper Mountain Sound. Cooper Mountain Sound. I like Sound. The, the Cooper Mountain. It's a nice, you know, percussion kind of sound. Yeah. I can appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and it also kind of echoes my dad uh, also being something of uh, a, a dilettante and everything. Uh, uh. He uh, went and created his own business for a while, and he called it Cooper Mountain Art Forms. Because oh he gosh. was doing... Freelance carpentry and fine woodworking. Oh. He made all kinds of really cool furniture, and that was his business card for the longest time. So well, that makes sense because if you look it up, and I'll do a link to in the show notes to your studio from the pictures I can see. I've never been there yet, but I hopefully will be checking it out. There's these this, this beautiful deep woods yes. that so he made that by his from his hands. Yeah, it was oh he and his friends. There are. There's Super 8 footage of them oh uh, raising the A-frame beams with a system of pulleys and an old El Camino. Like oh it was. God. Oh my God, an El Camino! Come on. Yep. Okay, let's just let's just kind of just go. So my <laughs> first husband had an El Camino, and oh, we nice. laughed because we. So Jed and I went to Aloha High School, which I've referenced in many episodes prior to here. It's a high school in the suburbs of Beaverton. And when he would drive up, people would make fun of me, like, what is that? Is a car? It's a truck. It's a car. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it's having a resurgence that, you know, the episode El Camino, it's a Netflix movie from oh, the, yeah. the Breaking Bad. Totally. And just you saying that just makes me chuckle because, yeah, that El Camino can pull things. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's It's got some heft. It can do oh, a thing. Oh, my God. Yeah, so they, I mean, oh, they spent all their free time hanging out, drinking wine, smoking weed, and building a house. Like, that was what their... their avocation was and which I look at that and I compare that to my own lifestyle and that of my friends I'm like we don't do anything like I feel like I'm wasting my life they're building houses and writing songs and like yeah so oh my god always trying to always trying to keep that in the back of my mind when I'm doing whatever I can well listeners if you need a sound technician a producer we now have someone in with our podcast family Jed um, that owns Cooper Mountain Sound. Yeah, come on down and see the space. I mean, awesome. Yeah, at, we're we're actively looking for folks to come who want to take advantage of the rich acoustics of the place. Yeah. It's gorgeous. I can only imagine, especially being on the mountain. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So let me um, ask you a couple questions about your misheard. So tell me what you remember about Stunt Up LA. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was about. I had to I had to Google when it actually came out, and I was roughly right. I was about seven or eight when it came out. And let me just tell you, it came out April eleventh, nineteen eighty three. Yeah. So I was eleven. I'm guessing you're like seven, eight, because you're younger than me, yep. right? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. And so I was, um, I was definitely aware of music and um, listening to the radio on the weekends. Casey Kasem's top forty. Oh my god! I um, love that. Reach I would, for the stars. Uh huh. <laughs> and uh, we would go in and visit some family friends on the weekends and they had cable which gave me my first exposure to MTV oh my god and and youngins um when MTV was out in its infancy of 82 83 you literally had to almost be rich to uh-huh. have it and when you found a friend that had it you were like hey hey best friend uh-huh <laughs> so they... I would spend just hours like my parents would be visiting with these folks yeah. and I'd be just spending hours checking out cable the magic of cable <laughs> And so, like, there were these music videos, and I remember Spandau Ballet yes. being one of the ones that was in rotation, rotation. Yes. and it also came up on the Top 40 stuff, so it was definitely, you know, music wasn't as uh, omnipresent as it is today, yes. but whenever there was an opportunity to hear something that was uh, popular, it was on the radio, it was in malls, it was inescapable. So, I always had cause to 
hear the song, but I've always also been a person who hears the music first and yes. I'm drawn to the melody and yes. the, the, the harmonies and the rhythms far more than the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, it's not surprising that like it, the, to me, the lyrics wound up being just a series of sounds, yep. not actual words. That makes, sense. that makes sense. And so when I actually would listen to the song, I couldn't tell you what they were actually saying. Right. Um, and if I were to sing back, which I, what I tended to do, yeah. I would often make up the words just to make the right sounds. And yeah. that's, I think how Sergeant Chu came to be. <laughs> what I love about that. So on episode six, if you haven't listened, please go back. I actually meet with famous author and also um, wrote for who wrote for Rolling Stones and many magazines mm. in detail. He and he wrote many a misheard book. Oh nice. So that's how I got to know him. He said most uh, misheard songs are two categories. It's about food or sex. <laughs> so when I when you I reached out to you and you said Sergeant Shoe, yeah, I, I get it. It's some kind of chew yeah, or you that. know, whatever. So it makes sense. It's natural. Now the cool thing is like I said, it came out April eleventh of nineteen eighty three. It was released by New Wave Band Spandau Ballet. They did other songs, but I think that's the only song that I knew that's about That's the only one I could think of. I mean, going yeah. back, obviously it's easier now than ever to browse through back oh, catalogs. Yes. But it, they definitely weren't a hit machine. Like, they weren't they weren't recognizable for anything more than that song throughout my childhood by yeah. any stretch. Well, you want to know a little bit more about yeah, that Yeah, please. Okay, so it was um, their third single from their third studio album of the same name. It was actually written by not the lead lead singer, but the one of their band members, backup vocals. He also, just like Jed, is a guitar guy. He can also do synthesizer and piano. Gary Kemp. He wrote it, um, and he wrote for all the music for Spanda Bella. He actually had 23 different singles. Dang! <laughs> but we only know of this one, or at least are familiar with this. He wrote the song. Oh, my God. This is the universe talking to us. He wrote the song at, its, at his parents' house. Whoa. While living there. And we just talked just a second ago <laughs> about Jed starting his wonderful sound oh my studio. God, that's amazing. I'm starting to kind of get a little... No idea. Wait, he wrote this song? What? Yes. In his parents' house. Oh, my God. That's insane. <laughs> we did not know this, everyone. So I'm just kind of I'm oh freaking God. out because this is, again, the universe saying, of all songs for Jed to pick... Whoa. Is this one? And when I do um, research on a song, I just kind of pull what you know what the song is about, the inspiration, which I'll talk about in a second, and where. And this specific song, they made a point that they said he did it at his parents' house that while living there. Is phenomenal. Whoa. Okay. All right. So it's going on. So the inspiration is it's actually in its original album version a six-minute song. Okay. Yeah, I, I noticed when I was re-listening recently on Spotify, I had radio edit. I was like, well, they they probably you know they probably explored a little more on the album. I didn't realize it was six minutes. It worth. really is, and, and they were smart enough to, of course, cut it down no. um, um, because they wanted the airplay. And it, it actually was inspired by a tribute to Motown and Marvin Gaye. Oh, and who was mentioned in the lyrics? I didn't know, and the sound he helped to establish it. So now I'm going to listen to it again. Yeah, now that I think, of, now that I understand how words work, I yeah. should actually listen. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> um, and then according to um, Gary Kemp, he also said, um, I wanted to write a song, this is his quote, so I just want to let you know, quote, unquote, I think I wanted to write a song that was a bit like a Marvin Gaye, Al Green song, okay. a blue-eyed soul song, which, yeah, exactly gets that feel. It was at a time when, um, when it was me concentrating on melody first, rather hey. than the sort of riff and groove. Oh my God, I'm freaking out here. Um, Kemp also said, "True became a song about writing a love song. Why? Why do I find out hard to write the next line? That's one of the lyrics. Yeah, he I was, literally wrote that. Yeah, when I, f I, I think when I became more aware of what I was actually <laughs> singing, uh, I did always find it the self-referential nature of that. Like, why do I find it so hard to write the next line? When when songs do that, I always find that particularly charming. Yeah. You know? And, always, and he put it in the lyrics. That's cool. As well as, I want the truth to be said. And he said, because I didn't want to write it down because there's nothing more embarrassing that you're saying. I don't know what the truth, you know, what the next line is of the songwriter. And then he yeah. actually puts it in the song, which gave some endearment, right? That is really legit. Oh my God, this is, this is blowing me away. <laughs> and then the other part of the inspiration of the song, it was partly written about Kemp's platonic <laughs> relationship with altered <clears throat> images singer Claire Grogan. I don't know who that is, but he must have had some kind of hmm. platonic um, relationship that he felt needed to be in here. But the main gist of the inspiration is the, um, the tribute to Motown and Marvin Gaye. Which, yeah, that is... I would never have... If you paid me money, I would not have been able to identify that that's what was inspiring it. That's cool. Right? I have to go back and listen closer. Me that's too. And, and I'm just still... My, I'm, listeners, my... <laughs> 
hair is standing on end because you just heard, you know, us getting to know Jed and his family and the house and the song studio and everything. And there's a lot of... Um, there's parallels. Parallels. That is a trip. Okay. So the song was a huge worldwide hit. It peaked at number one in the UK singles chart on April 30th, 1983. Again, I was 11 and you were eight. Mm -hmm. For four weeks. And that's how I remembered it because it, it was definitely in my psyche back then. It became the sixth biggest single selling single of the year and reached the top ten in the weekly charts of many other countries. Was it? Do you remember if it was? So you would have been in junior high. Oh, oh cusp of it, yeah, because I'm in sixth grade at that time. I think junior yeah. high for me was going on twelfth grade. So I gotta guess this was a big yeah. dance number. Oh right? yeah, the slow dance yeah. thing. Oh yeah, let's, yeah, let's right? talk about the slow dance. <laughs> right. I got to imagine that it's like kind of like tailor made for that. Yes. Yes, because it was in many uh, dances that I came from, and I mentioned it in, I think, two other episodes. Um, it was when, you know, the boys were on one side, the girls were on mm -hmm. another, and then the you would ask, like, ask Jed if he wants to dance with so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> and then if Jed said no, you would see that girl crying in the corner. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Weeping with their friends <laughs> consoling. It's ridiculous, but, you know, teenage love. Um and then it was also the biggest hit and their only major hit in the U.S. That's why you and I yeah. only know that song. We didn't know the other 22. Yeah, they were just big in Europe, probably. Yes. Reaching number four on the Billboard Hot 100 in the autumn of 1983 and topping the adult contemporary chart for one week. And then in 2011, so um, about eight years ago, it received a BMI award as one of the most played songs in U.S. history with four million airplays. Wow. <laughs> like, that's really? Phenomenal. Then it tells me I really need to write one song. No, seriously. <laughs> At Jed's uh, recording there you studio. Go. Double whammy. Double whammy. And then the last thing I want to share is in 1985, so two years later after this hit, the band performed the song during Live Aid. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. So, you guys remember I mentioned in episode five about Queen doing their you know, most memorable um, live performance in li um, Live Aid? They were there too. And so for some of you youngins, if you don't know what Live Aid is, oh, um, yeah, there are. I uh, know. <laughs> yeah. The original event was organized by Bob Geldof of Boom uh, Town Rats. Um, he was also known for being the actual um, actor also in The Wall, mm -hmm. Pink Floyd, right? Shaving off his eyebrows. Shaving off his eyebrows, which many a drag queen do today. Of course. <laughs> Um, and, and also a mid jury to raise funds for relief on the ongoing Ethiopian famine. That's what it was. It was the basis yeah, of was, Live Aid. It was huge. And be prior to Live Aid, I'm going to, you're going to remember this too, in that same vein, which started the impetus of Live Aid, he had done a song of Do They Know It's Christmas. That's right. Yep. And a young, I think 11 or 10 year old Mel bought a cassette tape or a single of Gosh. that because they would sell at the local, you know, record stores and all, not all, but a majority of the proceeds would go to help. And that was the first of that kind. Yeah. Back in the 80s. Did it, what, did it come before We Are the World? Uh, mm, I think so. Okay. I think so. Okay. Yes. I think this was the, the impetus of it. Live in, then We Are the World came on. Nice. In 1945. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Um, and then um, it, they actually billed Live Aid as kind of the global jukebox because the event was held simultaneously at Wembley Stadium in London, and that's where Queen performed everyone else, as well as, and by the way, it was 72,000 people in Wembley Stadium, I can't imagine, at the same time at John F. Kennedy Stadium in Philadelphia, and then they said in um, Philadelphia there was about 100,000 people, and televised. Now that I didn't know. I didn't realize it was in multiple locations, uh -huh. and so the acts were spread between the two? Yes. There was some English yes. or yep. European and yes. some American. Oh. I never knew that part. I didn't either. That's so a trip. that was okay. a great thing to know. To but me, it was just like a TV thing. <laughs> I, I assumed everyone was all singing yeah. together in one spot. Well, then it tells me if it was done simultaneously, that means one of the locations had it in the regular like daytime, mm -hmm. and the other one had it at midnight and you or five. That just right. <laughs> so this song, in its own little one song that we knew about it, really was a, a great part of the culture at that time. Absolutely. I mean, and there's something really timeless about the structure of it that. That upbeat of a guitar yeah, with that deep reverb, and then you've got like that. I think it's a DX7 or something oh playing God. those kind of like that FM synthesis chime sound that was everywhere in the early yes. 80s. That was the that's the bedrock of the song, yeah. and then it's like all quiet, but then he breaks into this super kind of uh, emotional, almost yeah. semi operatic voice yeah. as he this gets much up. Too much is true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Chorus. Yeah. And it was like yeah. this loud, quiet, loud thing before Smashing Pumpkins ever made it a big deal. Like it was like they really had this sense of dynamics yes. and the song structure was atypical of a, of a 
throwaway pop song. Well, that's Mr. Gary Kemp, and I bet you while we're talking about it, and actually, Gary Kemp, or if you know Gary Kemp, I'll be sending an email to one of his social sites. I kind of want to get to know him now, <laughs> since it sounds like we are cut from the same cloth. I think so. There's a kindred spirit there, and I think the universe is telling us, get a hold of Gary Kemp, <laughs> um, and he is still alive. I did check cool. on Wikipedia. There was no end date. Nice. So I'll I think, take it. I think we need to reach out to him and see what other um, bits can he can share with us that'd be awesome and so if you know gary camp or I'd, be, I'd be curious to know if he ever considered having sergeants be a part of the song <laughs> we can maybe, ask him that maybe too. that was maybe i was mentally tapping into a creative inspiration <laughs> well and that's a funny thing you bring that up because when i talked to the author on episode six gavin edwards who wrote many books and actually when he wrote his three books of misheard songs he got to talk to a lot of famous people okay um and the songwriters he said i asked him hey does that piss him off <laughs> and he's like no a majority of them i thought it was delighted they were delighted to find that their song that they created or they were known for one was john Wayne, missing you okay yeah, yeah um he said they really thought it was just uh, they chuckled like oh my god that's funny that that that's how someone else heard it because i just <laughs> don't want to talk to a songwriter or someone that's known for it and then get angry. <laughs> yeah, no, I can understand the, yeah. the trepidation. Yeah, so I think, um, so again, if you know Gary Kemp, a former um, Spanda Ballet, send anything you can to us at our email at songs at gmail. That's M-I-S-S-H-E-A-R-D songs at gmail. And hey, let's get this connected because I would love to have you come back. Oh my God. And if we can talk to him. That'd be incredible. Wouldn't that be incredible? <laughs> I, I'm putting it out there in the universe. All right. Let's so, make it happen. Yeah. And I, I tell you what, one of the things um, that universe is listening, right? Just like all of you are listening to. And then also don't forget, we have a Patreon, um, Miss Heard. You can just look that up. It's attached to my show notes as well. So if you want to get um, a special video where you can see Jed and I, because, you know, you, you just hear us. But we, we look good visually, I have to say. <laughs> Or you want to get this episode um, 10 before the Wednesday, that's how you do it. Nice. So, Jed, what other things um, that, you know, from what, what we've known of each other and now that you have this great new side hustle, hopefully it will be a full gig. Yeah, I can dream. You put it out there. Um, what would you say to some folks that are like new musicians that are like thinking about wanting to cut an album? And it seems so daunting. It seems like it's only for rich people. It does. And that's I think that's part of the reason why... Uh, Jesse, who's my partner mm -hmm. in the enterprise, and I are interested in doing this. We want to make it more accessible. I mean, we're in an age where now more than ever, uh, professional recording technology, professional, um, honestly, professional gear of all flavors is uh, more consumer-based than ever and accessible to the average creative person. Now, that's opened the, the doors to a lot of great artists that didn't have mm -hmm. uh, the the dream of a record contract previously with new distribution channels like YouTube and Spotify Absolutely. and all that, that sidestep the traditional slog. Um, we want to be able to give people access to uh, a high quality professional recording experience without having to shell out ten thousand dollars exactly and so like we want to and you know this this is a labor of love for me I'm not right at this point I'm not I'm not really having any thoughts that I'm going to be retiring at any moment. I just want to do something that I love and have, and I have the space to do it. So, you know, anyone who's wanting to uh, record in a space like this, just practice, practice, practice. And when you feel like you want to give it a try, reach out and find the right spot. And we, it could be us if you're in the area. Well, and you know, you sharing that, that, that this is your passion and, and that that's how things great happen because you're not infusing it as well. I, I want to just, this is going to be, What's going to pay my bills? Oh God, yeah. It's it's fulfilling your soul of music, and mm -hmm. it's going to be good because, and it's going to do well because of that intent that you're putting out there. Yeah. right? we've been talking about, you know, possibly coming up with like a annual scholarship program oh, for God, younger musicians or something, that. like where we where we fund or donate the time and do the recording and oh, get at least the stems for folks, and uh, yeah, just trying to find come up with creative ways to make it so that talent ha finds the platform. Yes. You know. Oh my God, I love that. And especially with, I don't know with your boys, what school they go to, but I don't, I've been hearing and it's sad because I have a lot of friends that are educators and I have several that are actual um, administrators and principals. Mm -hmm. That music schooling is, we're losing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not seen as essential. <sighs> and I can understand that being the decision that is made, but uh, this is another way to try and reach out to the community and have people invest mm -hmm. in, in uh, finding other ways to give that experience the kids we actually did host uh 
before we were kind of opening our doors to the public public when it was just being used by other lives we did open our doors to a, a small uh public semi uh school of rock kind of oh, experience where we had a bunch of kids come in well on the instruments and oh, it was for about you know, 45 minutes, had the parents there and stuff, and they, uh, everyone had a great time. I mean, as a kid, just thinking about, I mean, I freaked out when I had the, the recorder in yeah, grade school, yeah. and then, the, woo, woo, I mean, I can't imagine being in an actual sound studio. Yeah, being able to play on a, yeah. on a Wurlitzer, or a vibraphone, oh hitting some chimes, wailing on a drum kit, and playing oh, that, on a couple upright that, pianos. That so is good to know. That's another thing that I, we want to do. We want to do events like that, that okay. are, are about community outreach, and not <sighs> just about, you know, cashing a check and finding the next hit song you right know? right and that's how you find your next next potential customer we'll see you know but oh my god you have been a delight i'm so glad we reunited i'm telling you guys it's been 10 years it has it's so crazy and, and i mean with social media it feels like it hasn't exactly but thank goodness it's for been that. great to reconnect and um and i'm gonna t- tell everyone jed looks like he's not aged in the 10 years oh, likewise, so. believe me. <laughs> but um i will put in the show notes again uh a link to his recording studio as well and then any other uh, other things that we've talked about here but if you have any questions or you want to get um, connected with myself again i'm at misheardsongs at gmail.com and if we can get gary kemp that will be a future podcast that we'll be sharing with our uh, folks that are on our patreon account so please sign up fingers crossed all right well thank you jen thank you perfect that's I'm it relatively painless right that's all this. When people come, they're like, what? I'm like, we just, as long as I have this. Yeah, yeah. That, it's just a conversation that has some uh, some talking points. But I am freaking out. I'm like, I stop this.